You'll find your seats, please. We do have a lengthy agenda tonight. would also ask if you would like to speak <clears throat> this evening. There are sign-up sheets in the back. We'll be collecting them in a minute. And uh, there are two separate sheets. If you're unclear about which one you need to sign up, sign up on both. Please. And we'll sort it out. Okay, as we get started here, I'm uh, pleased to see the Alamo Area Council of Boy Scouts Troop uh, 537, I believe. Pack 537. Pack 537, excuse me, it's been a while since I was in the Boy Scouts. And uh, also, the Girl Scouts, Troop 95. So before we get started, I want to appre appreciate you. Uh, being here this evening. So, with that said, it is now 6.36, and I will call the Castle Hills regular city council meeting to order and determine whether a quorum is present, and a quorum is present this evening. Um, I wanted to let everyone know uh, we've come up to the 21st century, and we now have public Wi-Fi. Uh, in the building, so if you have your phones, you can connect to that. And uh, for watching you stream or watching yourself on TV, I'm not sure what you'd want to do with that, but uh, if you'd like to, you can. So it is available, and the passcode for that is CH Guest 209. Now, I haven't been on it myself, but I understand there's a little chat section underneath Ustream that gets pretty uh, lively at times. And that isn't what's here. It's all small letters. Well, will somebody let me know if uh, capital, uh, small, excuse me, uncapitalized CH guest 209 is working, and if it's not, we want to make sure we get it right from the beginning. It is, Gene. Kelly, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So tonight, as I said earlier, we have the Alamo Area Scouts, and tonight they will be doing uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, but at this time we're going to ask Mr. Pinkston to come forward, please, and uh, do our invocation. Right. Let's pray together. I uh, just want to come to you, Heavenly Father, tonight and ask you to be right in the middle of this meeting this evening. I want to thank you for these council members who uh, sit and take care of our city in their decisions and in their leading. I pray that you would give them wisdom tonight. You said in James 1, if we need wisdom to ask and you'd give it. And I just pray you do that in this room tonight. I pray uh, that the city staff, I just thank you for them. They're how they take care of us, uh, Chief Dover, the fire department, uh, Chief Simons, the police force, just watching over them, keeping them safe, and and just uh, giving them a deep sense of the appreciation our community has for they and all the staff here. Uh, for these young citizens behind us tonight, these young scouts, uh, guys and gals, uh, God, just help them see a great example in, in how to lead and serve in a community tonight. And then uh, just as a result of each of us being here, both citizens and leaders, uh, that we just, uh, in a great way, make this a better place to live as a result of how we uh, conducted our business tonight and what happened here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Pinkston. Now, if we'll have uh, PAC 537 and Troop 95 come forward to do the Pledge of Allegiance.
Looks like we're going to have an official flag raising tonight. So, uh, Guard attention. May the audience please rise. Color guard advance. Color guard, prepare to post the colors. May the audience please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, of liberty and justice for all. May the color, color guard prepare, uh, post the colors. Color guard dismissed. The audience may be seated. Thank you, Troop Five, uh, Troop Five and also uh, PAC 537. Great job, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, the next item on the agenda, would someone please bring the, uh, Janet or someone bring the, oh, okay. Thank you. Do we also have the sign-up sheet for the regular? Okay, good. All right, still people. As you come in, if you weren't able to sign up, just please let me know uh, as we um, move down this list, okay? All right, we're going to go in order. I'd like to remind everybody this is citizens to be heard on non-agenda items. That means that uh, for three minutes, uh, you can get up and tell us exactly what you think, mostly. And uh, then we can uh, move on to the next person. Okay? There is, I would ask tonight, there is a number of people that are, that are signed up, from what I understand, on both charts. So uh, when we get into the other one, I would ask if, um, although we're going to stick with the three-minute limit, I would ask that we also use, um, if someone got up and has spoke, uh, about that particular item, you might want to say I agree with that or come up and speak your mind as you will. Okay, with that said, the first person on the agenda. Oh my God. Oh, 
forgot the mic's on. Okay, first, first, item, first person on this, uh, citizens to be heard under, and a desire to speak on non-agenda items is Frank Paul. Mr. Mayor, should I wait till you come back? start me yet <laughs> are we ready I just want to uh, Frank Paul 112 Shalimar I just want to make a couple of remarks about an agenda item that was pulled from the last meeting and I believe it was pulled because it was determined either to be improper or illegal in our form of government we are a court of record and the agenda item was to set to put for to put the uh, city secretary over our courts, which was improper and wrong. Mr. Mayor, could you, uh, I know Mr. Gregory won't answer me, but he's our city treasurer. Would you ask him if he knows the, what is our total revenue for the courts? Mr. Paul, I do understand that you would like to do that, but if you would address that question okay. uh, to the city manager, he'll get with Mr. Gregory and Mr. Gregory will respond accordingly. Thank you. All right, I'll be glad to, I'll be glad to, you want to ask him, he's saying he can ask him now or what? No, we'll have to do that at a later date. We're All not right, to well, I'll go ahead with what I'm saying then. Thank you. Our total revenue in the courts is about $1.35 million. That's revenue. Of the $3.5 million, 380000 is projected to go to the state, which puts us down about nine and a half, nine and a quarter. We have expenses of about $320,000. Our net income for that court for the operation with two certified clerks is about six hundred and twenty five to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Why would you want to mess with that? Why would you want to mess up an operation that runs smooth, that is a good operation and doing what the court needs to be done in the court of records? And fortunately it was pulled last time, but I'm bringing it forth because knowing certain people on council, it's probably trying to find a way that they can bring it back and, and do something with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Next person on the, on the list is Jill, you're signed up. Did you want to speak? I'm not sure if you crossed your name out or not. Jill Morin. Yes, ma'am. That's fine. All right. To make sure that we get that on there. Okay. Next item, next person is Chance Kaufman. Chance Kaufman, 118 Honeysuckle. I'd like to start out by saying all of you should be ashamed of yourselves. Our city council meetings are a train wreck. They've been described in the media and as, and I quote, a marathon of drama, rancor, and parliamentary chaos, and also brutal. So brutal that forcing someone to sit through it could qualify as an enhanced interrogation technique." End quote. Is this what we want our city to be known for? Whenever these three things are mentioned, three names are included. You have one member who is running some sort of agenda. No one can seem to figure out what it is, unless it's fear and intimidation. There's another who wants to be able to destroy documents because he either does not want to stand behind what he says or wants deniability. Then there's the third. I'm not really sure what he stands for, but he votes in lockstep with the other two. You three are making a sham out of our city's political process. You three are making decisions without any long-term planning or any thought about the long-term ramifications. Decisions that you, will not, that you will not have the burden of living with. The burden will be on the younger generation of this city. City employee morale is at an all-time low. It is getting to the point that whenever there's a city council meeting, 
employees are wondering if they're going to have a job when it's over. Is that any way to run a city? With the way things are being run, how are we going to recruit and retain the outstanding caliber of employee we have now? These are all things the city council needs to think about and questions you need to ask yourselves. You need to put the pettiness aside and start making decisions that truly benefit the city, not only now, but 10 to 20 years from now. My wife's grandparents, who helped build this city, would roll over in their graves if they could see what was going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, Chance. All right. Next person on the list is Ginger Majors. Thank you, Ginger. Okay, next person on the list is Jen Blaine. Hello, um, my name is Jen Blaine. I live at 104 Iron Gate, and I just wanted to support what uh, Mr. Frank Paul said, and also to um, thank you for your time and your consideration. And um, I know that some of these meetings can get a little bit long, so I appreciate those of you that are working hard in the best interest of our city, and for the families that have chosen the city because it's a great place to live. So let's keep it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blaine. Next person on the list is Pamela Ferris. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we'll do. Okay, next person on the list is uh, John Squire. Mayor, Council, in the interest of open government and full transparency, I demand that items 19, 18, and 17 be moved in that order to the beginning of the agenda and ahead of agenda item number five. I believe that Council owes the public that is here tonight, and the public here tonight deserves that right. So items like these are not done late in the dark, late in the night, in the dark of night, outside of the public view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Squire. Um, next on the list is Bonnie Hopke. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Bonnie Hopke, 111 Emerson Lane. I'm speaking now at this point to request that the council pass two new ordinances. The first, that there be a limit on the number of items on the council's meeting agenda, or a time limit be placed for discussion on each agenda item. Each council person should only get three minutes, just like the citizens, or a time limit be, pl be placed for ending the meeting. Anything not covered in that time frame would have to be tabled until the next month. This would facilitate public involvement in the workings of the city and would mitigate the chances of the council members or citizens nodding off during the proceedings. I would also like to propose that inane agenda items, such as item number 13 on tonight's agenda, be moved to the end of the night so everyone is not bored with these totally irrelevant items. My second re ordinance request is that the title for this portion of the agenda and the portion title, Citizens to be Heard on Agenda Items, be changed. It is apparent to me that while we may be heard, there are members of this council that are not listening. So I propose the titles be changed to Council Listens to Citizens' Concerns and Opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hopke. I noticed some people that came in after this started. If you'd like to speak, uh, we'll have uh, another sheet back there for you to sign up on. Okay. All right, um, Mike Flynn is next on the list under citizens to be heard, non-agenda item. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. I'm Mike Flynn. I live at 111 Hamilton Lane. A little while back, Mr. McCormick wrote an article in the Castle Hills Reporter urging citizens to show a little more civility. Shortly thereafter, I committed Mr. McCormick on his article. I have spoken at Citizens Be Heard on numerous occasions to try to remain civil and speak only to the facts as I saw them. However, under, I understand where the inf incivility originates. It comes from a deep frustration by citizens that their insights and opinions are not being considered. It comes from a feeling that certain members of the council are less than forthright regarding their agenda. And it comes from a general recognition that certain members of the council are trying to circumvent the laws of this city to implement their agenda. <clears throat> if they want to know the origin of this incivility, these council members need only look in the mirror. I have yet to hear any kind of plan or strategy that some of our more recently elected or re-elected council members have in mind to help resolve some of the issues facing the city. Since actions speak louder than words, it appears their goals are to usurp the authority of the mayor, limit the role of the city manager, and consolidate city management into the hands of a select few council members. However, section 2-134 of our city ordinances state that the city manager is the administrative head of government, not the city council. According to the city, the city of Georgetown, Texas website, the manager is hired to serve the council and the community and to bring to the local government the benefits of training and experience in administering local government projects and programs on behalf of the governing body. And I'd like to emphasize training and experience. The manager prepares a budget for the council's consideration, recruits, hires, and supervises the government staff, serves as the council's chief advisor, and carries out the council's policies. Council members and citizens count on the mayor to provide complete and objective information, pros and cons of alternatives, and long-term consequences. Alternatively, the council is a legislative body. Its members are the community's decision makers. Power is centralized in the elected council, which approves the budget and determines the tax rate, for example. The council also focuses on the community's goals, major projects, and such long-term considerations as community growth, land use development, capital improvement plans, capital financing, and strategic plans. The council hires a professional manager to carry out the administrative responsibilities and supervises the manager's performance. In summary, the city council should provide guidance and set the agenda for addressing the needs of the community, then leave the city manager alone to execute the administrative functions for meeting that agenda. In their recent book, The Death of Expertise, the authors <coughs> referenced the work of David Dunning and Justin Kruger, two research psychologists at Cornell University. The researchers demonstrated that the dumber you are, the more confident you are that you are not actually dumb. Certain members of the city council are excellent examples of the Dunning-Kruger effect. For certain council members to think they have more expertise than a trained professional with 20 years of city management experience is just stupid. Mike, will you give me a moment here just for a second? Mike's time is up. Is there anybody who signed up that'd like to relinquish their time to Mike? Jennifer, go ahead, sir. Three more minutes. Thank you. I believe the action of these council members have demonstrated a pattern of incompetence. They have tried to pass agenda items in contravention to existing city ordinances and have attempted to, attempted to cut funding for positions required by those same ordinances. This demonstrates a lack of understanding coupled with an inability or an unwillingness to familiarize themselves with those ordinances. Currently, section 21.027 of our ordinances provide that a member of the city council can be removed for incompetency by filing a petition of removal for an application to a district judge for an order requiring a citation. Should the city council move forward with removing our current city manager to, re to satisfy the personal and political desires of certain council members, then such action, I believe, would be warranted. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay. Next on the list is uh, Scott Whitty. keep us on track tonight. Uh, I just want to say that uh, in my experience with our city managers, 
and our department heads. I've had nothing but um, just wonderful experience with all of them that I've dealt with. Um, we've got a lot to be proud of with our city manager and our department heads. They go above and beyond the call of duty to help the citizens of this city. And they're doing it with dwindling and dwindling resources, interference, budget cuts, positions being unfilled, and it's making it more and more difficult for them to do their job. City Council needs to lay off, give them what they need to do their job, and then back off. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Okay, next on the list is George Booth. Okay. Uh, next on the list is Robbie Casey. Good evening, Council, Mayor, citizens of Castle Hills. I'm so happy you're all here. It is so nice to see a full Robbie, building. could you state your address too, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> 144 Castle Hills Drive. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not going to take much time. But uh, I agree with the last people. I, I, I agree with everything they said. I only have one request. Give the citizens a chance to question the council members under oath. Could that happen? If you'll get with Mr. Rapley and uh, at, after the end, I'll have Mark uh, talk to Mr. Rapley and we can't address you directly, but we'll sure be glad to uh, look into that for you. Mr. We, Rapley, if you could get with the uh, council, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. That, I think the citizens deserve that. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're moving on here. All right, I'll be moving the uh, con gen consent agenda down so we, as a matter of time and the amount of people we have here, uh, to take it up at a later time during this meeting. Next on the list is the new business, conduct a public hearing on application from the Christian School at Castle Hills, serving as the agent for the property owner of the Castle Hills Baptist Church requesting an SUP for the purpose of utilizing preschool buildings located at 2,220 Northwest Realtory Drive, legal description CB5778, block lot 29, Castle Hills addition for preschool educational use as a continuation of the preschool that has historically occupied these premises since the school's inception which spans over decades. Mr. Pinkston and Mr. Eason, if you'd like to explain your request of the plan SUP before the public hearing. And I'll go ahead and open that public hearing. And it is now 7.02, so we're in a public hearing. Go ahead. Good evening, I am Michael Pinkston. I'm the superintendent at the Christian School at Castle Hills at 2216 uh, Northwest Military. And good evening again to, the, to you, Mayor Howell, and all you council members. Uh, we're grateful for your past support in our previous uh, special use permit granted back in September 2017. We are also thankful for the opportunity to come back tonight with our SUP application. The Christian School at Castle Hills was established in 1961, preschool and kindergarten program that uh, became an elementary school uh, in 1981, and we graduated our first class of seniors uh, in 1987, the same year we were accredited by the Association of Christian Schools International. A thousand graduates today dot the globe, serving and leading in so many places across all disciplines of life. At, uh, as most of you know, in uh, 2016, we became an independent school, independent from the church there. And as a, at the same time, we secured an agreement with Castle Hills Church for the lease purchase of approximately 50% of their facility space. And to date, we've had great success in uh, raising the funds towards that end. 
At the same time, uh, we lost use of our historic preschool building on the northwest corner of the campus closest to Winston Lane. Thank you. Um, as a result, we're snug as a bug in a rug. Uh, not much room to, uh, to move around uh, without that building. Um, and then, of course, you know, BASIS occupied that building this past year as you navigated uh, your way through that. Um, recently, with the help of an area uh, family foundation and scores of community supporters uh, running to our side, we've gained significant financial support and have been able to renegotiate the purchase of the church properties to include that preschool facility and a significant amount of parking adjacent to that facility, both on the north and the south side of those buildings. Now, uh, we're here again uh, b uh, before, the uh, before the city council uh, to request the expansion of our SUP to include our preschool buildings and the adjacent parking, uh, which the school has occupied since its first, uh, since those buildings were first uh, constructed many decades ago, as well as a portion of the Danny Lane property on the north end that is closest to the school properties, which is the next item on the agenda tonight. For clarity, in both of those special use per, uh, permit requests, uh, there'll be no change in use, there'll be no change in trees or the significant uh, canopy our pro properties provide. Uh, there'll be no uh, new buildings constructed, no change in traffic off Winston Lane. I know that was an issue uh, just a year or so ago when y'all were uh, uh, discussing the use of the properties. And, um, and then uh, no change or adverse effect on our great neighbors. Uh, and a highly positive change in returning a significant number of acres, about seven to be exact, back to single family residential. Um, so uh, over the past five weeks, we have met with dozens, uh, a little over 30 of our neighbors in uh, meetings that we've hosted on our campus, as well as knocking on doors around us and uh, received nothing to date but positive feedback from every person that we've met with uh, personally. These include residents on Danny Lane, Castle Lane, Winston Lane, as well as uh, many other residents in the larger community. And I think tonight, in fact, there have been some letters submitted by residents on our behalf. Uh, we have a plan that we think will be a big win for the city. Uh, a, a great win for the neighbors, uh, especially those immediately around us, uh, but also the larger community as, it, uh, as the tax base would be influenced positively and a win for the school. So in closing, we have the privilege, to, we've had the privilege to be good neighbors and a positive part of this uh, wonderful little community uh, here in Castle Hills for almost 58 years. Uh, there's no place anywhere that we'd rather be than Castle Hills. This community has been great to us, and it's been our intention to be good to the community. Uh, we have a priority to do the right thing, to cross all the T's, dot the I's as we move forward, uh, as we have in the past, and to be transparent in every way. Uh, with your help, we intend to be here another 58 years, serving children, families, and the community. I want to thank you for your help in the past, and I appreciate your willingness to hear our request for the future. Uh, Dan Eason is the vice president of the board of our trustees. He's a resident here in uh, uh, Castle Hills, a real estate broker, business owner, and he's been involved in the school's effort to purchase the property from the church uh, from the inception of that effort. Uh, he will uh, just uh, help uh, briefly explain the details in the plan in this application. Thank you. Um, this is the, what you see up here. I'm, I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, kind of where we are and, and what we're asking for uh, uh, tonight. The, uh, uh, as you know, about two and a half years ago, the church decided that they wanted to move north of, uh, of town and uh, build another uh, campus 
and they put all of this that you see in yellow uh, on the market. We were able to negotiate with them, as uh, uh, Mr. Pinkston said, a, a deal that at least allowed us to uh, operate, continue to operate in this uh, grayed out area uh, right here. And then we just consolidated everything. Uh, any students, anything that we had over here, we just we moved into our school buildings here. We then just kind of sat on the sidelines as the uh, the church decided, you know, looked at different uh, opportunities to sell the property, and uh, we uh, just thought, you know, we went through the basis and uh, the uh, memory care and others that uh, maybe that they were negotiating with that we aren't even aware of. Yeah, just we. Uh, we stood on the sidelines as we just waited anxiously to see who our neighbor was going to be. Uh, in that process, then, this uh, Grist property, we went out and we bought it just because we weren't, we were uncertain of our future, and so we bought that just in case, just so we had some sort of, uh, of option if it was going to be an option. So we purchased that piece there. Uh, the church then decided that they... Uh, we're going to stay uh, and keep uh, these buildings. Let's see, keep, kind of keep this area right here. Uh, that they were going to, they wanted to have a presence, continue to have a presence here in uh, Castle Hills, and then maybe go open up a, uh, a satellite uh, in uh, north of town. And so we just immediately, you know, negotiated with them to purchase what you see here, highlighted in blue. We wanted to buy as much as possible just to control our own, our own destiny. The, uh, uh, the thing is, we do not need all of this property. We've, you know, at one time we were going to have, uh, we wanted to have a football field here. Uh, we have negotiated a deal, you know, on the south side of uh, San Antonio uh, by the AT&T Center where we have a, just a state-of-the-art uh, uh, football stadium that we are, uh, that we're leasing. We have a long-term lease with them, and, and so we're happy with that. Uh, the playground that we used to have right here in this section, we, when they put this property on the market, we consolidated that. We moved that playground uh, over here. Uh, and so uh, we were able to, to get those properties under contract, but in order to make this deal work, we said, well, why don't we, let's sell these pieces then that you see here in blue. That's this. Uh, including part of the, uh, the Grist uh, property off of West Avenue. What we're asking for in this SUP uh, tonight is to, and what was approved by zoning you know, last week, is uh, because uh, we've got to revert this back to school. This was our original, you know, the, the original preschool was here, Original parking was here, original uh, ingress and egress, but uh, uh, it's, uh, we have to get, if we're going to purchase this, then we have to get the SUP approved back just for use of the school. We're also asking uh, for SUP for this part of the Grist uh, property. Uh, they're currently, we'd like to have some sort of buffer. We've, it's just really, is a park setting back here. We aren't going to build any buildings. There is a house there right now. Uh, there's a, a garage, there's a greenhouse. We like the idea of still being able to use that maybe as a science lab, uh, just uh, for storage uh, that we have for some of our lawn equipment in the garage. Uh, but uh, again, just kind of as to have as a, a buffer. In doing so, we would also build a, a fence. We've already built an eight foot privacy fence kind of right here, separating the, the school property and Danny Lane. We would continue that that fence and go on where you see it's marked here in brown. Uh, we're excited about this plan because, uh, as Mr. Pinkston indicated, you know, it's, it really is a win-win-win uh, solution. One, we get to be able to you know, control who our neighbors are. We're going to turn this back to residential, which is a win for the, uh, for the, the city. And uh, and then the uh, the church wins because they're able to you know, finally sell this property and do what they want to do north of town. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Okay.
because this is a public hearing, we have a number of people signed up and uh, if you didn't sign up, don't worry, I'm gonna call at the end in case uh, you didn't because of the fact this is a public hearing and we'll sign you up. So the first person on the list is, uh, and I apologize in advance, I don't think I'll get this one wrong, but there's some names on here that uh, I may botch up. So with that said, uh, Douglas Toscano. Good evening, Mayor, good, good evening, Council. Um, I actually live on Danny Lane, I'm at 110 Danny Lane. So I'm kind of tucked in the corner right there. Um, I've been dealing with Michael for the past two and a half, three years. We kind of need transplants to the, to the area. We like it, we want to stay here. But uh, I'm a really good proponent right now for these guys. I think they're, they've done a really good job. They've worked with all the neighbors on the street. There's four of us on that street and I've had discussions with all four, including Mr. Pinkston. All four in grants for it. We like the fact that we can actually have two, possible two lots at the end that will be residential. Have no issues with that. That brings a little bit of tax dollars back into the city, hopefully. Uh, we like the fact that they're gonna continue with the fence. They're gonna do that. Everything we've asked them to do, they've done it. No questions asked. Uh, I'm a really hardcore, I can really hammer somebody. And he's been really, really good with me. And so he's been really good. He's done everything we've asked him to do. So I like what they're doing. I like the fact that they're returning everything back to the city. They're gonna allow the uh, residential areas to be residential areas. They're gonna take care of their side. They've taken care of us on that side. So, you know, I'm a proponent for them right now. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Connell. Thank you. Okay, next on the list is Cynthia Dennis. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Cynthia Dennis. I am a resident at 364 Townview. Um, my son is an eighth grader at the Christian School at Castle Hills. Um, I also have a child who's in the Girl Scouts at, at Castle Hills. We've been residents since 2007, and we, we love the community. Um, we love the Christian School, what it's done for my son, um, for all the children there, making them servant leaders. Um, it's such a blessing to have this campus in our community. Um, we did go through some um, bumpy road with um, when basis having to divert our, our way around um, to get to the school, but we did it and I just see a lot of wonderful things coming out of the school um, and um, they've just been really great for the neighborhood and I just wanted to say something short and sweet um, about the, the community. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Dennis. Uh, next on the list is Bonnie Hopke. No, sorry. Pamela Ferris. Okay, we'll hold Pamela on yours. Okay, let's go on down the list. We're looking for, um, nope, nope. Steve Ackley. Stephen Ackley, uh, 118 uh, West Castle Lane. Uh, this is not the first time I've been in front of the council uh, speaking about the church, but I'm very happy to say that I'm, that I'm very happy to be here and, and uh, be a proponent of this uh, particular plan that the Christian School has uh, come up with. Uh, we've been through uh, many, many uh, uh, events uh, over the past 18 years that I've lived on Castle Lane, West Castle Lane, directly opposite the piece of property that the church is, uh, the school is planning to turn back as residential. And uh, it's uh, very heartening to see that uh, our plans, our thoughts for the, for the neighborhood are, are finally coming to uh, fruition. Uh, the school has been very transparent in their dealings with us. They've uh, uh, put out their plans uh, in a way, and I'd, I'd like to re uh, remind people that under the church settlement that we had uh, the lawsuit on, that that was one of the features that the church was supposed to come to the neighbors before anything came around and, uh, uh, you know, tell them what, was, what their plans were. And this is the first time that that has really happened. And I'm very grateful for that. 
Uh, the plan has a lot of merit to it. It, it doesn't change a building, uh, an iota, on the church property. Uh, it reverts back, as the school said, to their, to their usage. And uh, with the loss of the base of school in that particular area, uh, the traffic has uh, been uh, considerably reduced and, and is, is basically a, a steady state uh, situation for that. Um, a big win, I think, as the, they mentioned, that for the city is the reversion of those properties on South Winston on opposite my house in West Castle Lane back to residential usage, which uh, will only enhance uh, West Castle Lane and uh, probably unfortunately raise my taxes just a tad, but uh, uh, it's a small price to pay. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of this and I congratulate the church, the school uh, for coming up with a, a decent plan that uh, satisfies everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Next page. Brother Dilling. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Brother William Dilling, 201 Gladiola Lane. <coughs> Excuse me. And I was uh, outside of actually the United States when the meetings that the others have referenced with the uh, fact finding and so on came up. So maybe my questions are understood already or somehow were clarified before, but I, I just don't see, I basically I think it's a good idea, but I don't, I'm, it's a little short on details. And I think we need to be clear about nothing's being reverted to uh, residential. It, all of that property is zoned residential. That's why you have an SUP. So it is residential. So now the question is, what happens with it? And unless there's deed restrictions, I don't see how this works. Because the property, the so-called athletic field, the South Winston Lane property, always was residential. But then somebody else came along and bought it and decided, well, they're going to make it into a uh, you know, church-related, nonprofit school, whatever. And I don't see what's stopping anybody from doing that, unless there's deed restrictions. And I, there may be other legal mechanisms to accomplish that, but as the plan stands, but I don't see the guarantees in it. People can say nice things, and, and trust me, I've lived here 21 years, and there were a lot of things said revolving around the Castle Hills Baptist Church, and most of them were untrue, vitriolic, and we all remember. So to avoid that, I just don't see the detail is missing from Mr. Pinkston's. And I, I, my other question earlier, I asked Mr. Schnall, if this is a hearing on all four at one time or just the one, because his presence- It is. His, it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't think that's no. clear from the sign-up sheet, but- um, Hang on. Mr. Bear, you only opened the item for the first public hearing under item one. So that is what is before the council for consideration. The applicant went ahead and made a comprehensive presentation, I hope in the interest of time, but the council is going to hear this public hearing, you'll close this public hearing, gotcha. and I ultimately move to item number two for action in regard to the property at 2220 Northwest Sorry. Military only. Sorry about that, the notes were that I wrote were uh, broken down exactly like that. Thank you, Mark. Go I ahead, need, Brother Dillon. I, I need we'll 45 be seconds back. Um, so my question is, <laughs> as presented in the global overview, I would be in favor of the, what this hearing is about, that is the preschool. But I'm not in favor, it, in favor of it at this one-fourth of the presentation because there's no guarantee the other would go through. And they have the property to build a new preschool on West Avenue if that's what they want. I also didn't hear anything said about giving up their idea about having access to uh, West Avenue. And that was certainly a big bone of contention before. So it just seems a little, not messy, but a little, um, a lot of loose ends there. And I think the preschool, if, if it's not gonna go through, then it needs to move someplace else. There's certainly plenty of room on the, the the church property, 
and, and then that whole block, actually it's maybe uh, two blocks, could be um, sold for residential development. Um, and I think there needs to be some guarantees in there so that some out of town, and by that I mean outside San Antonio, developer doesn't come in and just pull the rug out from the whole um, kind of tenor of this conversation. The other thing, I just think in the interest of transparency, I for one would like to know who the owner is. We keep saying, you know, the, the First Baptist Church of Castle Hills, and it, it, as far as I understand, does not exist. I don't know who the people are that own this property. And then to have a thing saying, I'm the agent on behalf of the owner. Well, who in the world is the owner? Why can't we just say who they are? They must have a name. They must have a corporate name somewhere, um, unless it's a shell game. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brother Dilling. Okay. Okay, due to the fact that uh, a couple of people signed up and they didn't put the agenda item, is there anybody else who would like to speak on that item, uh, on the first item? Quinn? Howdy, Quentin Baker, 304 Foxhall, and I guess I ran the mayor off. <laughs> I, I'm speaking in favor of, uh, of the request for the SUP. Um, concur with prior statement uh, speakers that I think this is a, a win for our neighborhood, a win for the city, and a win for the Christian school. They have been very forthright in sharing their plans with us. Um, I think they're they're to be commended in thinking about the neighborhood and returning the properties to residential service. Uh, we've, been, we've been praying and hoping for this outcome for a long time, so I am strongly in support of it. Uh, an issue that did come up in the, uh, in the zoning hearing um, is the uh, area that's included in the SUP, the grist property on uh, West, West Castle. You can see part of that property is going to be kept for the church. Part of it's going to be sold off as residential. And right now, that whole chunk is in the application for the SUP. So it'd be good to delineate which portion of that property actually goes into the SUP and the part that's going to be sold off for residential. But otherwise, I think the plan is a very fine plan, and I strongly support it. Thank you, Quinn. OK. That uh, looks like, unless there's someone, somebody is pointing at someone. Oh, Laverne, I thought you were pointing at your neighbor there. Sorry about that. Come on up, Laverne. Always good to see you. I'm Laverne Jaffet. I live at 12 Shady Cove, which is just off of West Avenue. Uh, first, I'd like to let you know that I am not against churches. Uh, I think I'm fair Christian. Uh, my daughter went to T Texas Christian University and has a degree in education. My two sons went to Trinity University and one of them went to St. Mary's Law School and I have a granddaughter that went to Baylor University and was uh, over at uh, Incarnate Word. So I feel that I am not against the Christians whatsoever. I am against this situation because I am very much an advocate for our A residential. All of this property that they're talking about is still, to the best of my knowledge, is A residential, every bit of it. The lots that are over there, behind, over from the church, all the church property, the A residential that's, that's gonna come up, I guess, on the next item, <laughs> 6909 is a uh, lot that they're wanting to use. To my knowledge, I would just like to wonder really how can you ask, how they can ask for an a, uh, SUP as an agent for Castle Hills Baptist Church when there is no Castle Hills Baptist Church. They're asking for an SUP as an agent for Castle Hills Baptist Church. 
That means the Baptist church is really the one that's asking for the SUP, it looks like to me. Uh, I called to find out the exact name of the Baptist church. I was never able to speak with anyone there. They would keep giving me different numbers to call. Each one would say, leave your name and number, and we'll call you back. You could never speak to a body. Uh, I noticed the other day at Zoni, Mrs. Baker, I believe it was Jana Baker, had asked one of the gentlemen uh, earlier if they had had an SUP, and he said yes. If they'd had an SUP, how, why and how should they be coming back? for an SUP. A lot of this just doesn't make good sense. Number one, I noticed that they must have had a meeting of all the neighbors or a bunch of the neighbors. I was not invited. I believe I'm within X amount of feet past the requirement. And those people are all under the impression that all of this land, and I'm talking about all of it for, for the church, the acreage, the whole bit is all a residential. They were under the impression, it sounded like from the, that you get back, that we're getting all of that land back. It's going to all be back to a residential. It's already a residential. The Grist property that, that's on 6909, which is your next item, maybe I shouldn't be speaking about it, but it has to do also with an SUP. They're, they're wanted, and it's an A residential. They want, they're wanting more property, and for that, it sounds like they were going to just use it for a playground and uh, different, different childhood items, et cetera. I just feel like that this whole thing is um, encroaching on our A residential property, all in that area completely. Uh, I would just ask that y'all absolutely I noticed the application on the item number two was just a blank application that they call for, for zoning, just a blank application. It was not signed. How can it be? How can we even accept an application that's not signed? I call the Bear Appraisal District, that school, I guess it's called... Uh, Castle, a ch Christian school at Castle Hills. They say it's the owner, like in maybe two years ago. It's off of our tax rolls. I just feel like that um, things are overbearing and we're not getting what our A residential property should be at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Chappett. Appreciate that. Okay. Looks like that we uh, have, everyone's exercised their right to speak. So with that said, it is now, uh, is it seven? Sorry about that. Oh, it's 7.32 and we will close <clears throat> the public hearing. Mark, are we going to go ahead and move ahead on, on this particular item or, or vote them all as three at the end? I think you should follow the agenda, go to item number two, read the agenda item, and have the council discuss and take possible action. Okay, what about item one? One of the same thing. Nope, sure wouldn't. Thank you. All right, let's go on number two and consider the recommendation from the Zoning Commission and act upon ordinance number 2018-1113 regarding the application from the Christian School at Castle Hill serving as the agent for the property owner of the Texas, uh, excuse me, Castle Hills First Baptist Church requesting a SUP for the purpose of utilizing preschool buildings located at 2220 Northwest Military Highway, legal description CB5778 block slash lot 29 Castle Hills edition for preschool education use of, as, not of, as a continuation of the preschool that has historically occupied these premises since the school's inception, which spans over decades. Mr. Isbrand, 
Did you, uh, he's here this evening, Mr. Isbrand is our chairman of the zoning board and uh, he is here to make a recommendation from the zoning commission on this SUP. Good Mr. evening. Isbrand. Good evening, mayor and members of council. Uh, the Zoning Commission met on Tuesday, November the 6th to hear the presentation by the applicants to conduct a public hearing and to uh, make a recommendation to you. Uh, most of the individuals who spoke tonight also spoke at the public hearing last week, so I won't um, uh, r repeat what, uh, what, the, what, what you've already heard. Uh, I, I would like to um, make one point as, as we look at these uh, two elements. The, we have to remember that an SUP is granted to the current property owner of a piece of property. When that property is sold or transferred, that SUP is lifted. It is no longer in effect. So when we talk about um, a debate or the semantics of whether this will be single family or is single family, the fact of the matter is there is currently an SUP in place that the church received for the property and what we call, what is the term tonight is the football field. That, that SUP goes away if this property is sold. So if the Christian School of Castle Hills is acquiring this property, that would be the purpose for them coming here tonight to ask for the SUP for the piece that they want to use for their, their preschool. Um, the rest of this would revert back to single family and as you've already heard, from the members of the, uh, the, the, the Winston Street area, from Dr. Ackley, whose property borders on the, the other side of this, there was a, a lot of support expressed for this. And the fact that the school could have, if you will, a more contiguous property for it to operate its school and return to the community some type of cohesiveness in terms of single family residential in that area of Winston Lane. Um, with that said, the Zoning Commission voted unim unanimously five to zero to recommend to you that you accept the request of the Christian School for this SUP. Thank you, Mr. Isbrand. Um, let's go ahead and get a, excuse me, why don't we get a motion I'm, and a second and then you can ask anything you want. Second. I'll probably move. So moved? Second. So moved. Okay, second. by uh, uh, Moretta? A second. second. Second by... Ms. McLean. Okay, uh, let's start off with uh, discussion. Uh, we'll start at the right this time for a change. Douglas, did you have any questions for Mr. Isbrand or anybody I having? Have We've already, you've already discussed and then we go into that afterwards as a traditional way of us doing that, Mr. Uh, Mark. Uh, number one was a public hearing. That's when the public got an opportunity to speak on the application. If the public wishes to speak on the uh, consideration and recommendation, consideration by the council, the recommendation of the zoning commission, I think that would be appropriate after members of the council have an opportunity to begin a discussion, but prior to voting on Ms. Scott's motion. That's the way we generally do things. I'm sorry, uh, maybe I didn't explain it right, but because this is an action item, uh, the public will be allowed to speak again based on the sign-up sheet. Douglas. Can Thank I you. have that copy of the confidential report as reference, please? May you have a copy of what? Can I have the copy of the confidential report? Thank you. Uh, this goes to the city attorney. In the in this, uh, can I just explain why he has that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, over the weekend, after um, the agenda was published with the packet, I had quite a number of phone calls from different people who had concerns. And since I had attended um, one of the meetings. Um, I decided that it would be fair to ask Dan Eason, who I've known for years, and as you know, who's on the board of the school, if he could answer these questions. So one of the pieces of information that he brought to answer them. Yeah, well, I have my mic on. Is, is this report that has to do with what they're purchasing? Uh, 
This is a question, from Mr. Schnall. In the agreement with the, prop the two individuals in this property, they want to share parking spaces of the same property. Does that circumvent the ordinance that requires a, uh, an institution or an individual to, to have X number of spaces for their particular property, and if somebody else has to have it for their particular property, there cannot be any property. Is it true you can't have sharing of property spaces, of parking spaces? Private property owners can make whatever agreements they want about shared parking or shared just about anything else without knowing the details of what the city's requirements are for each piece of property based upon the criteria in, the, in Chapter 50 of the Zoning Code. I, I can't render an opinion on your question. I would want to look at it and determine it independently with the information that's necessary to answer that question. Um, I also am not certain how it's relevant to the question of whether the council should grant the special use permit, which stands on its own four legs of its application as presented to the council and the zoning commission. By agreeing to the SUPs of any of these things, are we, it does it put the city in the position of agreeing to any contract that may come up between the parties? No. That clears that up in my mind. I have one or two more questions. Yes, sir. This is going to Mr. Snow for a second. A church can occupy any residential zone, can it? Isn't that correct? Generally speaking, any zone period generally speaking yes if it can occupy any zone why would it need an SUP because our ordinance requires certain types of uses in the a residential district mainly things that are not single-family residences to have an SUP so if we grant an SUP and they decide to use the property for slightly different purposes as stated Will they be able to do it, or will the city be able to say, you can't do it? If the city learns that a property with an SUP to do one thing is trying to use the property for something else, the city can take action to um, stop that unauthorized use. Um, it can take action to require the applicant to file an application for a new or revised SUP. Um, the city has that option. Do you know, is there any material difference between the SUP that's initially already been granted for these various properties and the new SUP that's being requested? Is there anything materially different? I have not seen either, I have not seen the initial SUP that was referred to that the church had. So I cannot respond to that question. Perhaps a representative of the applicant would be able to answer that question. Could we have the representative of the applicant come forth and answer that question? Of course. Question. Will you repeat the question? You have an existing SUP on the property. You're asking for a new SUP on the property because it's changing hands. Is there any material difference between the existing SUP that exists on these properties versus the new SUP that will exist on the properties if we approve these various considerations? Not as far as I know. It, what we're asking for is we're asking for it to be used for school purposes. And uh, I mean, that's how it, the church had that SUP uh, before to be able to use it as a church. At some point, uh, they had to go back, and uh, or we had to go in and and uh, apply for the SUP to be specific to uh, school purposes. Uh, as far as that piece goes, 
if you're asking if that was ever uh, initially used for SUP, I mean, if that SUP was for school purposes, I don't know. No. Is that what you're asking? If it was ever allowed to be used for school purposes? I'm asking, is there any difference between the original SUP that was granted and the current SUP that's being asked for? Is there any material difference in the SUPs? There is not. Staff. I'm sorry, it is not. It's an exact duplication of the previous process, obviously distinct from the previous application because of the locations of the property that are different, but everything else is the same. Are you willing to define now in public session exactly what school purposes are? The education of early childhood, kindergarten to 12th grade education. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Winger? Yes. Um, well, I, d I do want to say that, you know, since I spend a lot of time walking around the city, uh, meeting and talking with residents, one of the things that I've discovered over the last two or three years is that there are more parents living and moving into Castle Hills whose children attend this school than of any other private school that exists. It is an extremely popular school. The daycare center has also been extremely popular and I know that when BASIS moved in and took over that area, there was a great deal of concern uh, by parents um, who live here what was gonna happen with their children. So it's certainly understandable to me that the uh, Christian school would wanna take back the daycare center. Um, I think you know, it, they, they've been as transparent as they can be. I got a lot of questions over the weekend, as I said before, about guarantees. It says there are very few guarantees in life altogether. But, um, you know, I think we know the people fairly well who were asking for this. Uh, one of the questions that came up, because the documents are on the website, is who is Don Long? And so, um, Mr. Eason provided me with a picture of Mr. Long from their from the church's website. Um, it does appear that the church has changed its name, but from the Castle Hill Baptist Church to the Castle Hills Church. Um, I'm not sure if that's you know relevant. I don't know exactly what the name of the entity is officially, but initially the app the. SUPs that were given were given to the Castle Hills First Baptist Church, so I believe that's the reason that that name uh, appears on the documentation. Would that be correct? Okay. Um, in any case, Mr. Long is represents the church in that he is the executive pastor, which is you know understandable that that would be the case. So that's the answer to that. I'm not going to get into, you know, any of the other property at this time, right? Because we're only discussing the, the preschool at this time. So basically, as Mr. Pigson has said, all they're looking to do is continue the usage as it has been for many, many years um, and has been appreciated, apparently, by many people who live here. I do want to mention that one of the people who has been most concerned about this over the years is Wayne Carter and his late wife, Terry. And Wayne has written a very complimentary letter, which I thought was going to be read by somebody, but nonetheless, we have it, and he is fully supportive of this SUP. And that's all I have at this moment. Thank you, Ms. Winger. Uh, Ms. McLean. I would just like to give kudos to everyone involved. This seems to be a perfect, ex perfect exa example of synergy and just people getting together and working to create a good solution, a better solution. Um, I thank everyone for the thoughtful plan. It appears to create a nice consolidated area for the, for the school, which I think will benefit the students and everyone else. And it also returns some property to other uses for the city which um, creates that other side of the win-win. So thank you to everyone involved in putting this project together. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Ms. Scott, did you have any comments? Yes, I'm delighted Ms. McLean just said mine. I, I saw this as a perfect win-win situation. I'm very familiar with the, that preschool. It was a day nursery for a while. I'm very familiar with the property. It's a lovely property. 
Um, I, uh, like I said, I, I can't think of a better win-win use for this property to continue to use it for educating small children, young children, and um, at the same time freeing up some of this property that will no longer be covered by the church's SUP to sell it off and, and let's um, have some more residential uh, neighbors come on in. So um, thank you so much, Mr. Pinkston, Mr. Easton, for arranging this, for working so transparently with, with the neighbors and with the community. I commend you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Mr. McCormick. Thank you. I'd also like to express my appreciation to Mr. Pinkston and those who prepared your presentation. I thought they've done a very fine job, and it look, does look like it's been very transparent. I do want to address a couple of concerns that have been raised by other folks, and that is uh, what happens to the property after it's sold, what happens to the SUP. The SUP goes to the owner of the property, not to the land itself. And so when property changes hand, that SUP disappears for all practical purposes. The property is zoned A residential. It has always been zoned A residential, and the special use permit allowed the use by churches or schools or whatever use was, was subject to the SUP. As I say, when the property sold, the SUP goes away and it, it remains as it has always been a residential property. If somebody comes in and buys it and wants to put in, you name it, car wash, whatever, whatever kind of thing they might want to put in there, uh, they have to get another SUP, which means they have to file an application with the Zoning Commission. And the Zoning Commission will go through the same thing it did here. We'll have hearings, we'll have presentations, they'll be brought to the council and reviewed again before any further change of the use can be had. So to that degree, there is some further protection to the city for the future use of the property. I support the use of the property uh, by the school as has been requested. I did attend the uh, Zoning Commission meeting last week and I've heard the presentation and the arguments previously and the deliberations of the Zoning Commission and I agree with their recommendation. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Uh, that I, I had a question too about that, that cleared it up. Anyone that knows me as a general rule knows that I am uh, famous for lightening the conversation. So I'm gonna take 10 seconds to ask Mr. Pinkston and Mr. Easton. Uh, you said there was a couple of buildings on that property that can't be seen from the street or anything. Is that true? You went yeah. right into that now. That's not what we're No, talking. no, I'm talking about the one on the property you're buying now. You said there was a storage shed and that's something not, like. That's not what we're dealing with, Tim. Oh, okay, right. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold my question, but hold on to that, okay? Thank you very much. Okay. So with that said, we're finished with discussion and there are some people signed up for that item. Could I, could I just mention one more thing that sure. was raised about the parking and that we're dealing with the preschool. The parking has always had its own, this preschool has always had its own parking lot. Right. And it seems to me when we beat that up a number of years ago that a lot of the people, the parking really it wasn't an issue because uh, most of these uh, children don't drive yet, do they? Are they allowing driver's license for two-year-olds yet? I know some people drive like two-year-olds, but I was just wondering, thank you. Oh, the teachers, oh, okay, all right, we're good with that. Okay, so let's go on down the list here, and Mr. Takano, because you're signed up, uh, you can speak on this item if you'd like. This is item uh, two. the Zoning Commission item that, that we've been discussing up here. Because you are signed up and you signed up under the other sheet, there wasn't really a, a, a side, so I'm gonna let everybody speak who wants to speak on that item because there wasn't that many. Did you wanna speak on the zoning issue? I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Dennis. Ms. Dennis left, I believe. Okay, let's go on down the list. List, list, list. Mr. Ackley, did you have any comments, sir? Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to, oh, here's a good one. Brother Dooling. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council. Thank you. <clears throat> Brother William Dooling, 201 Gladiola Lane. And uh, again, I think the plan as presented is, is probably quite workable. 
But in terms of these, uh, uh, you know, yes, there's no guarantees of anything in life except long city council meetings. Um, <laughs> the, the property on South Winston Lane, um, I mean, a lot of people haven't lived here during that period. But that was, and as charitably as I can describe it, the church, not intentionally perhaps surreptitiously, but certainly with no fanfare, bought up approximately seven acres and then one time, and then just tore the houses down without a permit. And if that doesn't send chills up and down your spine about what somebody could do, then I think we need to find a way to make some guarantee about residential use of that property and exempting it from any SUP or whatever. Um, I, I wish there was a higher classification, but, I, but there isn't, so that's about all you could do. But I, I still think there, there, there is a way to, to guarantee that after 20, almost 21, 22 <laughs> years later, that that, um, really the rape of that land can be restored. And, and I think that's a serious issue. All the rest of this about, you know, where the preschool is and so on and so forth, I mean, I think having it confined is probably, probably good. Um, so that's really my, my main concern. I, I'm also concerned about the property in West Avenue just to not encroach, you know, commercial property any further on West Avenue. We've People may say it's um, a pipe dream to try and conserve that as a residential street, but there are people that live on it, that face it, uh, you know, and they may have some traffic, but it's still a residential street. Uh, it's not a commercial corridor, and, and so I just think that those two things, the seven acres on South Winston and the property on, um, on West Avenue, need to have some protection built in to this plan, which in my humble opinion is missing an awful lot of details. And uh, I just looked up on the uh, Bear uh, Appraisal District and this prop the property uh, is owned, that is the, uh, not that which the school, plus this whole ownership thing, I mean it's I guess lease to purchase or something like that, so I'm really not sure who owns what. but. It, it's owned by Castle Hills First Baptist Church. And again, I renew my request that I have made on multiple occasions. Who are these people? Where are they incorporated? Who are their members, their board of directors? And, you know, are they a, just who are they? It sounds like a shell game to me. And since we were shell games before 20 years ago, that makes me uncomfortable. But I'm, I'm not against the plan per se, but I think it leaves a lot still to be desired. Thank you. Well, Brother Dilling, uh, Douglas, did you, you had another question? Brother Dilling, could I ask you a couple of questions? SUPs can be granted with riders. Specifically, what type of rider would you put on this SUP? Well, I mean, I would defer any question. I'm not a real estate lawyer, and, and I would certainly the city attorney can, can come up with that. But, I mean, to say that there are no guarantees, I, I don't think that excuses one from at least making the attempt. I know this is a fact in a court of law. If you've made the attempt, it has some weight as to, you know, this is what was intended by both parties. So that going forward, it may not be enforceable, but I, it certainly goes to intent. So. I just think it's worth doing what, what you would do. I don't know if SUPs can have riders and they can't. Well, we never seem to use them, but <laughs> I wish we did. Um, well, exactly what type of rider would you put? What would you put in this rider? It's zoned residential and I think, it, it, you know, the church, the school, yes, they can do that. But anything else, those seven acres and the whatever, how much the acreage is on West Avenue, I think can be, be declared um, no longer available for any other type of pur purchase and let the buyer beware. I mean, if somebody buys it, you see, the problem was before it was bought up with no knowledge, no, none of this lovey-dovey transparency that we hear about today. It was just done underground and then overnight to tear them all down and want to put um, a park in it. 
pave over paradise and put in a parking lot. And, and it cost a lot of money to challenge that. And now finally it's going back with fingers crossed behind my back to residential use, but who knows? Maybe Basis wants a football field. Maybe they'll come by. So I'm just saying. I can't answer your question, Doug, because that, that, that would be something for the city attorney and others to answer, but I think it needs to be done. I just don't know thank, what it would be. Thank you. Ms. Winger, you had another yeah. comment to add? I, I do think that you know we kind of need to stay in a point of order here, because what we're talking about here, at this co point in time, we we're only getting two SUPs. The one we're discussing right now is for a daycare center that has always been there. We are not talking about the property across the street on South Winston. We are not talking about the Grist property. And if you'll notice, no SUP is being requested at this time because that property is going to be sold. The intention of the church is to sell it to a residential developer who will build houses which will put the property back on the tax roll. There is no guarantee that that's going to happen. I've discussed that with Mr. Pinkston and Mr. Eastman. The point is, that is their intention. Whatever happens subsequently will come back to the zoning and come back to the council. So we're not dealing with that at this time. All we're dealing with is the two SUPs that already exist for the purpose that they are being used and will continue to be used. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And we won't charge you with That's a point of order for that. Okay. May I call for the vote? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> 15 seconds, okay? Let's, 15 seconds, Max. We are talking about it because Mr. Pinkston presented it in his plan. And in my earlier comments on number one, I said they're, they're inextricably, inextricably linked, but, but they're not because they're broken into separate you know, entity or, or, or consideration. But that it's a key element of the whole thing. If that does not go through, then then I think this is a bad deal. That's Thank you, Mr. Uh, Newling. Yes, I, I, I asked to call for the vote. Call for the vote. Okay, we have a call for the vote. So before us is uh, consider the recommendation of the zoning commission and act upon ordinance number 201813 regarding the application from the Christian school at Castle Hills. <laughs> Serving as an agent for the property of the Castle Hills First Baptist Church, CB 5778 block slash lot 29 as read before in the minutes. So we have a motion and we have a second on the table. All in favor? And it is unanimous. Thank you, council. Now, we're moving on to item number three. We're going to conduct a public hearing on the application for the Christian School at Castle Hills for an SUP at 6909 West Avenue, legal description CB 5778 block 1, lot 3, to allow the school to use the property and existing structures for a children's playscape, picnic areas, maintenance sheds, <coughs> children's greenhouse, and use as existing house for additional storage and or for tutoring classes and offices. Okay, it is now 8 p.m. and we are going to open, excuse me, it's 8.02, and we're gonna open in a public hearing. Uh, due to the fact that we do have some people signed up, we're gonna go down the list and Ms. Dennis, are you here? Ms. Dennis is not here. Okay, we're going to go down the list. Uh, this is a public hearing, so we'll kind of suspend the rules a little bit. Mr. Toscano, since you did sign up, did you want to speak on this item, sir? Sure. You bet. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Trish Toscano, 110 Danny Lane. Um, when the school first approached us, I was kind of, you know, leery about it. Um, I have, they have my full support on this. Um, I understand the whole meaning behind the Grist property. 
it's special to me. It's a wooded area, the whole area before the school, you know, built our fence was wooded and then trees were taken down, cleared out so that there could be an athletic field. But, and you know, we had to kind of see the, the, you know, the back of the school and everything. We didn't like it. They worked with us. They built this great fence. They've been great neighbors. Um, I don't have a problem with them converting this property. I don't have a problem with them using the property as it is. Um, I don't have a problem with them selling off and dividing the property and bringing in some new life into the neighborhood. I like my four, you know, house neighbor, um, but I don't mind having more. It's a great idea. It brings more um, revenue into the city. It brings, you know, it's going to raise my property value. Um, my taxes will probably go up, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I don't have a problem with it. There's some concerns, I think, with some people about the structures being able to be seen from the street. The only people who see those structures are us, the neighbors on Danny Lane. And we don't see them because there's plenty of ground cover. There's plenty of bushes covering these properties. Will there probably have to be some type of way for them to get on the property if they sell off the properties off of West Avenue? Yes. I don't have a problem with them putting a driveway to get into that property. We've been told by them, and I believe them, and I want to believe them, that there will not be a pass-through from Danny Lane into that property that goes out to Northwest Military. There will not be able to be a pass-through from West Avenue to the back of the school if they put that fence around the property, which is what they plan to do. So the only people, like I said, who are truly affected by this are the neighbors on Danny Lane. And we have already stated through my husband and, you know, through Mr. Pinkerton that we all agree on this. The residents of Danny Lane like this idea. We want this idea. And I hope the council approves this idea. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, Stephen uh, Ackley, do you have anything to say? Okay. Oh, here's another one. Uh, Brother Dooling. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Uh, Quentin, did you want to comment on this? Okay, thank you. All right, so that completes the open hearing. Is there anybody else who would like to say anything before we move on? Thank you very much. It is now uh, 8.06. It's got to be a record. Okay. We're going to move on to item four on new business, which is considered a recommendation from the Zoning Commission and Act upon ordinance number 2018-1113A regarding the application from the Christian School at Castle Hills for an SUP at 6909 West Avenue, legal description CB5778, Block 1, Lot 3, to allow the school to use the property and existing structures for children's play space. Picnic areas, maintenance sheds, children's greenhouses, the use of existing house for additional storage and or tutoring classes and offices. Oh, there you are. Mr. Isbrand, go ahead. In the interest of time, uh, Mayor and Council members, I'll just say that on this item, the Zoning Commission also voted unanimously five to zero to recommend that you uh, approve the SUP. Thank you very much, Mr. Isbrand. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Do I have a second? And Ms. Winger is second. Thank you so much. Is there any discussion on this item? Douglas? I have one question. What is a children's greenhouse? Mr. Gregory, there's a, there's a greenhouse on the property and we would just, it, it just seems like it'd be a great use of that to put plants in and science classes to, to go over and use that during this time of year and forward. Uh, and uh, just, it's an existing structure that would have value to the school. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Pinkson. Uh, Ms. Yep. Winger. Yeah, and I understand that there are no buildings that are being added at this time to the Gris property. So the only question that I have, and this is something that was um, raised by Brother Dooling, is, um, is 
is there going to be any access from this property to West Avenue? There's not. Okay, so there's no extra traffic. There's no, no, no traffic issue. No. Thanks, Dan. That's it. Ms. McLean. Nothing, my comments from earlier stand on this issue. Ms. Scott. No comment. Mr. McCormick. Now, now, I get to ask the question. Oh, I got my 10 seconds of fame here. So, as anyone who knows me knows, as a general rule, I'm famous in lightening the conversation. So with that said, that little greenhouse over there, what kind of plants, mister? <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows why I asked on that. Excuse me? Okay, I was just wondering because of uh, the news, the front page this morning. But anyway, if, if you didn't see it, that's okay. Look it up. <laughs> so we're going to call for the vote now on this item. Oh, Mayor. yeah, okay. We have some citizens to be heard, uh, which we also had in the, uh, in the uh, public hearing. So let's see, Mr. Takano, did you want to say anything on this? Thank you. Mr. Ackley, did you want to say anything on this? Ms. Dennis has left the building. Brother Dooling. Brother Dooling, will you promise to take 60 seconds or more? Thank you. I've got to run out to the car. Brother William Dillon, 2-0, Barn Gladio Lane. And my, my only question here is, and, and I realize I wasn't going to download 225 pages, so I'm sure somewhere in the documentation, but I just want to double check, because this item says, I'm for it, but it says to approve uh, City Block 5778, Block 1, Lot 3, which is the entire property. So I, I heard you know, Mr. Pinkston say they're going to divide it, but without some meets and bounds or legal description of what they're retaining and what they're selling, what you're passing with this language is the entire, the SUP extends to the entire property. And I think that's contrary to what was said, and so I just think that needs to be clarified. Um, it may or may not also affect the other property over on the, that they're buying from the church, but that's kind of their problem because they're not selling it to, uh, to somebody else. But in this case, it is important um, to know exactly which property is covered by it and which isn't. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dooling. Okay. I don't believe anybody else was signed up. So let's go ahead and take a vote on this item. Discussion. This is, what? Discussion. Oh, sure, go ahead. If Brother Dooling is right, this SUP is for the entire property, not one half the property. Mayor. Yes. I may, if, if council will refer to the now therefore paragraph in the proposed ordinance, 2018-11-13-A, um, and this is consistent with Mr. Gregory's question earlier about putting conditions on an SUP. There are three conditions proposed under this SUP. The third condition is the portion of 6909 West Avenue to be under the control and use of the Christian School of Castle Hills is depicted as grist property SUP on the attached Exhibit A. And I believe the attached Exhibit A is similar to the uh, uh, aerial that is on the screen, and it would show the, the half of the Grist property furthest away from West Avenue would be the property that would be subject to, that would be the portion of 6909 West Avenue that the SUP would apply to. And I would ask Mr. Pinkston to verify that. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Thank you. Uh, was there anybody else before we take a vote? <coughs> okay, all in, uh, excuse me, we're going to take a vote on item number four, which was read. It's in the minutes. We have a uh, motion by Mr. McCormick, I believe, and seconded by Ms. Winger. 
and uh, we will do the vote now. All in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Pinkston. And all, all I'd like to say is uh, I'm going to take you up on that Pagonia thing. You know, pinky swear not to, you know. Thank you. All right, let's move on. The next item is uh, conduct a public hearing on conduct a public hearing on FY 2019 Crime Control District CCPD budget as approved and recommended by CCPD board. We're going to open this public hearing at 8:14, and it is item five. And we do have some people signed up. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. The uh, documents presented with this art article refer to notice before the hearing, but they don't give a date and there's no certificate of publication with it. The, the rule of the statute requires notice 10 days before the hearing and normally the certificate of publication would be submitted with the documents uh, for consideration by the council. I wonder if we have those documents. Mr. Stone. Mr. Mayor, I, I believe that Mr. Rapley can verify that publication was done in a timely fashion. Um, I don't know whether the publisher ordinarily provides a certificate of publication, but um, I don't think it's required for council action as long as the council gets confirmation that the requisite here, notice of hearing was published. Okay. It was, Mayor, and I can get copies of those distributed to all of council. Say that again? I said it was, Mayor, and I can get copies distributed to all of council of that. Okay. Was it 10 days notice, Mr. Rapley? It's 10 days notice. Yes. Great, thank you. That's all we have. We have a copy of the advertisement and then the public notice we put on the website 10 days out as well. Ms. Winger is requesting to see it. Okay, so staff has provided the uh, publisher's affidavit um, signed by the bookkeeper of the San Antonio Express News with a uh, clipped copy of the actual public notice uh, stating it was published in the Express News Classified on um, uh, 24 October 2018, which is more than 10 days ago. Thank you. Does that satisfy you, Ms. Winger? Thank you very much. Okay, um, where were we? Hang on. Oh, we're in the, uh, we're in the uh, public hearing. Okay, there's two people signed up in the public hearing that I can see here, and it looks like Sylvia Gonzalez. Sylvia, are you here? Oh, there you are. Hi, come on up. Sylvia's on the Crime Control Board. Thank you for your service. Too much work. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Sylvia Gonzalez and I reside at 103 Wickford Way. Um, I, I am on the CCPD board. Uh, I just want to say that uh, we do support our Castle Hills Police Department and appreciate all that they do for our community. They are really good. <laughs> if you need them, they come really quickly. Um, George Booth and I are on the CCPD board, uh, the Crime Control Prevention District, and we um, voted to approve the uh, 2019 budget uh, with the information we had at hand. But since then, we did an open records request and got quite a bit of information on the police fleet maintenance. What we have found in all um, of uh, the information was a lot of routine maintenance, which includes oil changes, flat tire repair, uh, brake work, balancing, and tire replacement. And of course, none of these are covered by uh, an extended warranty, which we purchased 
uh, on each vehicle to extend it to 100,000 miles. Um, it cost us uh, $2,600 per vehicle. Uh, we currently purchase tires at Firestone. So we kind of looked around and compared pricing and we talked with Discount Tire uh, and they will uh, beat any prices on competitor pricing and um, on tires. Uh, they also offer free lifetime balancing, free tire rotation, and flat tire replacement, regardless of where you purchase a tire, while Firestone charges for these services. Our recommendation is to keep all three explorers that have approximately 36,000 miles and um, a charger which has about 42,000 miles. And also, we recommend we not purchase any more of these extended warranties. Appreciate your listening to me. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Gonzalez. Thank you so uh, much. Also on this uh, signed up, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, Keith Capetta. Keith Capetta. Keith Napetta. Oh, Kevin. Kevin. I'm sorry, man. Kevin Napetta. Sorry, buddy. I already apologized in advance. So. Not that we haven't known each other for 30 years, but anyway, go ahead. Hey, my name is Kevin Kniff. I reside at 210 Hibiscus Lane. This was brought to my attention, and again, I support the police, and boy, they've been there when I needed them, when my dad was sick and everything else, and all the things that have gone on. But I'm looking at the condition of these vehicles, and I'm driving a vehicle that's 100,000 or miles or more. I know the police cars have to work right, and they have to be kept to, to kept perfect working condition, but I want, I'd rather, instead of buying new cars, use the cars we have, the, the police vehicles we have, unless if there's mechanically a thing really wrong with them, and instead of spying these extended warranties, maybe we ought to just take them to someone less that can look them over and make sure there's not a long-term problem they can catch. Because if I got rid of every vehicle I had at 36,000 or 40,000 miles, I'd be in the poorhouse. Now again, if the vehicles, if there's a real reason to get new vehicles, to keep us safe or help us with public concerns, I'm for that. But it's brought my attention that we're getting rid of these vehicles or thinking of selling them and buying new ones. And the ones we have now, seen, they don't have that many miles on them. So I'd like everybody to consider keeping the ones we have. And again, you know, why do we have to buy extended warranties? Because I did some checking too, and a lot of these cars are covered up to 50 or 100,000 miles, especially nowadays where they have to give you all these deals. So that's what I wanted to say, okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, that was it. That was signed up for that. Um, let's go ahead and get a, uh, well, it's a, since we're in a uh, public hearing, is there anybody else that would like to speak on this before we get into council's uh, thoughts on it? Okay, thank you. We're going to close the hearing. It is now 8. 28, 24. Okay. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, item number six, which is consider an act upon ordinance number 2018 1113B, approving the FY 2019 CCPD budget as approved and recommended by the CCPD board. Uh, Mr. Siemens isn't here tonight. Uh, Captain Zuniga, did you have any comments you wanted to make about that before we uh, get a motion in a second? Yes, sir, I can. Sure.
Mayor, Council, citizens. Uh, Captain Zinning here with Castle Hills Police Department. Um, we are presenting the same budget design as presented uh, for the last uh, six plus years. Uh, our intention was an approved budget and then move forward with operational decisions on needed fleet vehicles, all while remaining good stewards of citizens' money. Um, this included several possible approaches that uh, depended on a, a number of variables, maximize trade-in values on the, greatly aids on the uh, used vehicles. Historical lessons learned, uh, one of our co current board members on the CCPD was on the, when PD aborted uh, past purchase fleet vehicle uh, plans due to cost to the city for a more cost-effective approach. This vehicle uh, was one of four, uh, not all four of them caught fire, but this one was one that uh, was uh, caught fire after we kept it for four years uh, on the street. Um, it was a total loss. Uh, what we discovered on it was the, uh, because we do so much idling on our vehicles uh, as compared, and I know it was previously mentioned that uh, Bear County uh, keeps their vehicles up to 100,000 miles. Well, Bear County, their vehicles are assigned to each in, an individual deputy. These vehicles are not assigned, they're driven, some of them 24-7. Uh, in this case, the uh, equipment in the, in the vehicle became dry and brittle, uh, causing it to short out and it, and it, it uh, caught fire. Uh, we went back and looked at the other three remaining chargers uh, and they were all the same. They all had uh, damage uh, or failing uh, factory equipment. Um, let me put it back up here. Thank you. Along, uh, in addition to that, there are a direct correlation of increased miles uh, and hours uh, that are associated in downtime with these vehicles. Um, for example, uh, two weeks ago, we were down to uh, two patrol units. We had uh, four of them in the shop. Uh, we actually had to double up two officers in the car until we were able to get another car out. Um, the I checked also, uh, we use a model agency, which is a San Antonio Police Department. I checked with them. They keep their vehicles uh, 70,000 miles or three years. Uh, they don't, they get rid of them beyond that. And the hours uh, I was talking about earlier is idle time. It's real hard on our vehicles, again, because they're, they're we, they sit in idle a lot in comparison to other agency vehicles. It, um, there's a conversion on that. I don't know if you can see this one. Uh, we're talking about, uh, it was brought up as far as one of the cars having uh, low mileage, which is unit number seven. It only has 42,000 miles on it. Well, this vehicle has been the most in the shop. In fact, it just came back from the shop. It's leaking oil now. Uh, the reason we purchased the extended mile or the extended warranties is because this, this, is, not, this is not covered under uh, a reg the regular warranty, which has already expired. The Dodge warranty, Ford warranties, uh, they're only usually at up to 36,000 miles. Uh, unit four, which has the highest mileage, that one was the least, the one least in the shop, and, and that's why it has the high, highest mileage. If you look over here to the furthest right, the large, uh, the, the numbers, like the first one is 207174. I converted those idle hours. This is the idle hours, the 3056, and in the total, uh, uh, hours of the vehicle, taking that uh, 3556 and doing the conversion and adding the, its current mileage, it gives it a rough 207,000 miles on that, on that particular car. And conversely, the same coming down. Again, Unit 7 having the least, but it's already failing. Um, so we're starting to see uh, that one in the shop more increasing. Uh, it's our intentions to keep the Explorers because again, they do have the low miles. Uh, 
we are having some troubles with, with the explorers already. In fact, one of them uh, was in the shop for over a month with a transaxle problem. Uh, fortunately, that one did fall right under the warranty. There, one of them's getting pretty close to coming off the warranty as well. Uh, one of the other reasons that we're also electing and trying to get rid of at least the chargers uh, is DPS did a crash testing and uh, survivability is greater in an SUVs. Uh, that's why we're trying to elect to go in either the Ford or Chevy uh, and get rid of the, the Dodge Charger. That's all I have right now. Thank you, Captain. Um, let's go ahead and get a, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, let's go ahead and get a, uh, a motion and a second on the table before we go into uh, discussion. So moved. I'll second. Okay, so Miss uh, McClinton and Miss Scott seconded the motion. Okay, let's start on the left this time. Mr. McCormick, did you have any comments regarding uh, the item on the table, please? I have a question for Captain Zuniga, if that's appropriate now. Of course. Captain Zuniga, have you looked further at the extended warranty to see if the, the 100,000 mile warranty is uh, really useful to us? Because you commented several times that the damages sustained by the vehicles weren't covered by the 100,000 mile extended warranty. In that particular unit, the city elected not to buy the extended warranty. Um, and that's, we were, it was a total loss on that car. Uh, in fact, for all, all four of those, there was another one that had other uh, elect, uh, engine problems. You say we did not have extended warranties on those vehicles? That, that, that fleet of vehicles, uh, extended warranties were not purchased. So have you, have you considered extended warranties to see whether you think they're still useful or not? Absolutely. Uh, again, there's some of these cars that are already past the 36,000 miles. Um, if we don't have the extended warranty, it's going to be, it's going to cost us, uh, money for repairs for whatever the, the, if, if it's drivetrain. Have you looked at the history of the repairs that we have on these vehicles, uh, as compared to the cost of the extended warranty? Um, in fact, there may be a, a couple of examples and none that come to mind at this time where the, uh, they're probably going to be pretty close to the same, uh, the example of, of Believe Ms. Gonzalez stated, uh, I think it was twenty six hundred dollars or something as far as the extended warranty. Um, like I said, nothing comes to mind at, right at this point, but there has been an instance where uh, we've come close to that same amount on damage repairs or mechanical failure repairs. I think that might be worth future luck when when it comes time for the next budget to see if we really want to if we really get a benefit from the extended warranty. Yes, sir. It might compare it to the cost of the regular warranty. I don't know what the difference is. But 2600 was the figure that was mentioned earlier. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all I have. Ms. Scott, did you have any comments regarding the item on the table, please? Um, I did, um, because I did some research in this, because once again, I was surprised at the low mileage. But as I started to ask questions, and Captain Zuniga can either say I'm correct or not correct on this, but as I started to do research on this, um, comparing us to Bear County is ridiculous because our cars are going out anywhere from 16 to 24 hours a day, right? They're in use constantly. That is correct. Okay, so I want you to imagine your car that you have at home. Um, yes, it may only have 35,000 miles on it, but you're not driving it um, 16 to 24 hours a day. And during those shifts, those eight hour shifts, the car may not be moving and actually collecting mileage, but it's on and idling, correct? That is correct. It's okay. idling, it, which is in turn, you're not uh, circulating air, cool air through that engine block, right. uh, which is letting it run hot. And that's where you have that end so, result. So my understanding was you're heating the engine that affects the belts that affects all of the internal components within the engine compartment. They're getting heated, they're getting hot, they're getting warm just from the idling. So idling does add not really mileage because they're not moving, but it adds wear and tear on these vehicles. And the reason that I was told that these cars idle so much is because to run the flashers for safety is that you have to leave them on. Plus, if you get an emergency call, you don't want to jump in the car and have to wait to start it up and everything. You jump in and you go, you respond. That's why we have the response time that we have. We're two and a half minute response time, give or take, from what I understand. 
So when you're looking at mileage on a high performance vehicle like a police car, particularly in a department of our size where they're continually being used um, 16 to 24 hours a day, um, a lot of times, and like you said, how many do we have in the shop? Two, four? Uh, at a couple of weeks ago, we were down to uh, two cars uh, on the street and on three officers, on so one of them had to double up until we could get one back. Get one back. Yes, so we have multiple officers rotating in and out of these same cars throughout the day, whereas Bear County, one officer may drive one car, eight-hour shift, they park it, that's it. So um, our cars are getting a lot more wear and tear than just mileage would show. And um, all it took was just a little bit of research on my part. I read quite a few car forums that were like, don't let your car idle. Don't, you know, idling is, you know, causing extra wear and tear. So that's something that really needs to be taken into account other than just mileage. Um, in my opinion, is that your opinion as well, Captain Zanoon? You showed, you showed the number seven Dodge Charger that with the calculated idling time, it has over 200,000 miles on it? That is correct. Uh, the formula that uh, they use, one hour of idle time is equivalent of 33 driving miles of travel Okay. Miles. And so, and we have a lot of idle time. So actually, if you're looking at all of these numbers, you need to be adding quite a bit of mileage to those numbers. So to replace them every three years just seems like the responsible thing to do if we have one charger with the actual mileage and the idle mileage of over 200,000 miles. Um, I just wanted to clarify that because it was very interesting as I did my research and found out how often the cars were used because I was in the same impression. Officer comes on, he takes a car, he drives it eight hours, he parks it out here, it sits there. No, our cars do not sit. They are constantly being used. So thank you so much, Captain Zanu. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Uh, McClendon, did you have anything to add to this conversation, please? No, I, I, I was shocked to see how the idle hours do add up, and, and that's definitely something we need to take in con into consideration. Police cars do not drive the same as a civilian vehicle, and Absolutely not. so we need to take that into account. Ms. Winger, do you have any uh, comments, please? from what you said is that the reason that we have the 100,000 mile warranty is because there's a choice between that and 36,000? No, ma'am. The factory automatically, any vehicle comes with a factory warranty. It's usually 36,000 miles aside from like Hyundai or whatever they come out with 100,000. Uh, Dodge, Chevy, and Ford usually is a typical 36,000 mile warranty. Okay. But we buy an additional 100000 even though we don't run the cars for 100000 Well, generally, we, we typically run them between uh, sixty to 100,000 miles, depending. Now, the anomaly on this one was the three Explorers, which are low miles. And like I said, we're, the, our intentions are to keep those vehicles because of the low mileage. Uh, but the Chargers are just they're, they're so high you, miles. So you are keeping the Explorers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So now you showed us a picture of a car that was burning up that was a Charger, and I'm just curious, did, is there a Chrysler recall on this? I mean, since everything's burning up, wh why weren't the hoses or whatever changed? It, it was an electrical, it was a wiring harness against the firewall. Um, uh, as, as but you had it on several cars. It happened on that one, but looking at, looking at all the other vehicles, having them checked, they all had the same issue. They just never caught fire. Well, that sounds to me like there should have been a recall. Did you look there, into there it? There was no recall at the time. And you haven't reported it? I mean, I think there's a place to report that to the federal government, and they ha issue a recall. Um, I'm not sure on that, ma'am. Uh, that was something, I, that would be something I have to look into. Well, that's how they issue recalls, when something, I mean, if this is a problem with these cars, then we're not the only ones having the problem. Is that, well, again, this is something I'd have to look into. I think I was a corporal at the time when that occurred, uh, but it was it was a an issue that was yeah. again that would it would have been covered had we had the extended warranty. The city elected not to purchase the extended warranty at that time, uh, and and keep the vehicle for an additional year, a fourth year, which resulted in, in a car fire. Well, I, I would like to request that this be reported to the federal government agency that deals with recall so that at least, you know, they can look into it because the chances are it's happened to other cars, as I said. Th that's a strong possibility. Yes, ma'am, I'd have to look into it. Uh, I, we don't even know where the car's at. So, okay. I mean, it, that was traded in a long time ago. What, what about the issue that Ms. Gonzalez raised about uh, the lower cost of, um, of tire maintenance if we purchase from another um, supplier? Have you looked into that? 
That is, uh, we haven't looked into it. I mean, that is also a possibility. We, we try to utilize somebody that can get the car back out in a timely manner. I, I don't know if you've purchased tires at discount. It, it, they don't, they're, they work, they're working as fast as they can, but they're swamped. Uh, and usually trying to get one tire, we're not going in yeah. there to buy four tires. We, we're just buying one tire at a time as, well, as needed. Well, it just surprised me because I, I buy Firestone tires and they never charge me for maintenance. They typically do not charge us for, you know, if it's a flat repair. Uh, it, well, if it's a flat we repair, we bring it over here to uh, A&L Tire here on the West they Avenue. They sell, they sell um, a warranty that costs very little with the tires. Is there any way we can look into that? And then you don't have to pay for anything, even including if you have a flat. Yes, ma'am, we can look into that. Yeah, I think that would be cost effective. Um, I'm not right quite clear on the idling, and I'm sure there's a reason for it, but if you could explain it to me, because that also uses gas. That is correct. Well, when, uh, when we're, like Ms. Scott stated, when we're out, on, out in the field, if we're on a traffic stop or an accident up on the highway, we have to leave the car on uh, to leave the lights on, mm -hmm. leave the, the radio and everything operational. Uh, of course, yeah, that, that's called idling hours. Uh, and the manufacturers have installed a, an idling clock on all these vehicles for that reason, to show the difference uh, between the idling and the actual engine hours. Uh, if you recall, there was two different numbers. One was like half of the other. The, the larger number was the total idle hours, while the other one was idling hours alone, just the engine just sitting there without uh, it being driven. So, so overall, you, you feel that this is something that you've looked into over the years and that we're getting the best deal for the buck? Absolutely. I, I believe that um, in the long term, if we continue, if we were to revert back and, and, and try to keep these cars, again, they're starting to fail. They, the, the Dodge Chargers are starting to fail because they're driven constantly. They're More so than other cars? Right, well, those particular cars, again, the way that we had worked it out before is the, the, the Fords just didn't get driven as much because we had to sign them to supervisors. So that's why they had lower miles. Uh, the, t the Chargers accumulated more miles uh, with the exception of four, wh which was down in the shop quite a bit. Again, it, um, it was that w it, we just had to replace a fuel tank on that one. Uh, that was not a factory defect, that was actually uh, um, getting hung up on something in an alley or somewhere, so it had a ruptured tank. But that one is leaking oil. It just came back from the shop. It's leaking oil from the engine. Um, unfortunately, that is covered under warranty, so they fixed it, but we're gonna start seeing a pattern of stuff uh, failing on these cars. So you don't feel that if we change to Ford that we'd be better off? We, we could go to Ford, Chevy, it doesn't matter. They're, they're all gonna have the same issues, depending, it's just the miles and the hours that they're, they're driven okay. and idling. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Winger. Mr. Gregory, did you have any comments, please? In the budget under sale of equipment, 50-004500, you expect to get $69,250 from the sale of equipment. If now that, that is above the, the, um, the average. I mean, in the, in the past, I see spotty uh, amounts one way or another. How did uh, 69250 come about? If I may uh, ask Laura here, uh, for her assistance in this, she could speak to that. Budget, uh, the uh, board also had to have clarification on that. That was actually Ch uh, Chief Siemens. He did give me a number based on, I believe it was seven vehicles. That is correct, originally, and yes. that was trade-in estimation. Mm -hmm. If you need to purchase more vehicles than you presently have, do you come back before the council for an amendment to your budget? Typically, no, we would not. Uh, we would, we, if, if we had, if we needed to purchase vehicles, yes, we would have to go back before uh, the crime control and, and, and ask them. But that's not what we're looking for. We're only seeking to go with the uh, budget that was approved now and, and make the decisions as far as replacing the vehicles that uh, are needed to be replaced. Well, I think it's very interesting 
is if we're idling all these cars and suddenly the odometer doesn't make any difference anymore, but the idle mileage does, and it's impacting all the vehicles, instead of idling all the vehicles, why don't you just buy an additional car or two? Well, I mean, that's, that's an option that we can well, look it, at. It, it's it just seems to me that radically reduces the wear and tear on all the fleet if you turn them off and add an additional car. I'm concerned that there were four cars in the service bin at one time. That's dangerous for the city. And I'm just wondering whether we have enough vehicles. But it certainly makes more sense to me that rather than idle all the fleet all the time and we suddenly get these astonishing mileages because of idling, turn them off and add an additional car. So it's something that I hope the board will consider in their future budget because I think that makes a lot more sense than, than uh, damaging the entire fleet, just add a new vehicle. The next question in 50 past 009011, fuel, equipment fuel maintenance. And we've seen here from 2013, it went from 13,000, 2014, 7,500. Nothing in 2015, nothing in 2016, and in 2017, 5,300, but now we're expected to have $25,000. What has caused in a jump of five-fold of equipment and fuel maintenance in the budget? So the budget that's currently 25,000 is the past, I believe the past three years, it was the same number. Um, that line item is shared. The general fund also has the same line item that they, they use some of the expenses get into the general fund, some are put over here, uh, and it wasn't needed, but that's what they've used. Like I said, I think this budget number has been there at least four years, maybe five, but it's only utilized if it's needed. Well, I'm just looking at what we were given. The audited 2017 amount was $5,309. It was zero in 2016, zero in 2015. Seven thousand, I don't see 25,000 anywhere. If you see the 2018 annual budget column, it's 25,000 as the budgeted amount. However, it's only utilized if needed. I hope you do consider adding the additional vehicle and stop idling the cars. I think that makes a heck of a lot more sense than, the, than damaging the entire fleet. I've never, I've never heard of these idling numbers before. I'm, so, not, I'm not sure, sir, if, if uh, your, your personal vehicle, if they're included in, in privately owned vehicles, I believe that they are, um, but they, they're they for sure they're in the in, in police package too. Well, I hope the head of the CCPD comes before us next time or the chief of police comes before us next time, but I appreciate you coming before us now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Douglas. Mr. McCormick. You forgive my presumptuousness to ask this sort of question, but back in the old days, and I remember the old days. Um, the recommended technique for idling a vehicle a long time was to pop the hood because it allowed greater air circulation through the engine, kept under hood temperatures down, and kept the engine temperature down. So you reduce the effect of the idle time and the damage that occurred to the engine was reduced by some degree. I don't know whether that, how that works or, uh, nowadays, but I suspect that perhaps there might be some benefit to louvering the hoods on our vehicles to get better airflow through there. It's worth, uh, worth, worth a, a thought, I think, but that's just, just, just a, an idea from the past. Yes, sir, and I, I see what you're saying, but at the same time, I mean, I think being up on the highway, waiting you know, for a wrecker to show up and they're backed up, I mean, popping the hood, it's not really. No, if, if you had the hood louvered, you wouldn't have to pop it to get the airflow. Yes, sir. Mr. McCormick, that hadn't been such an old deal. I've seen that lately. I've seen it with DPS and things like that. Maybe that'd be something you could take up with the chief when he gets you, back. You mean, you mean you remember that far back? You don't look that <laughs> old, Mayor. I remember that far back. I really do. I, I know I'm going to look young, but I'm, I'm up there too. Okay. Thank you. Did anybody else have any question for uh, Mr. Zuniga? Hang on, George. Okay. George, uh, come on up. You signed up or relinquished your deal, so come on up. Hi, George Booth, 124th Dogwood. 
Council, Mr. Mayor. Um, Sylvia and I went through over 500 pages of records and all seven vehicles, and we were told at the CCPD meeting they were gonna replace all vehicles. I talked to a couple other board members, and they were concerned that we, if we buy all the vehicles at one time, if they had any latent defects, that we're gonna have the same problem with all our vehicles, and that would be a bad idea, and possibly that's why they had four vehicles uh, in the shop at the same time, that we should stagger them off, uh, buy them in different years, rather than having them all the same year. Um, likewise, the only maintenance that we found was just routine maintenance that you'd have with your car, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there's nothing special about the maintenance that we've had. We've had nothing excessive. And if we're paying $2,600 for the three Explorers that we did buy, we haven't used our warranty for anything. And if they change them at, 30, at uh, 36,000 miles, then we wasted $2,600 times three, which is a total waste of money. But likewise, we've had vehicles with 88,000 miles, 82,000 miles, 78,000 miles, none of these have any maintenance problems regardless of us idling them. So I don't really understand that all of a sudden now they had four vehicles in the shop because we haven't had any problems with any of the vehicles um, in all the 500 pages that I looked at. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, before we move on to, let's see, that's it on everybody that was signed up. Before we move on, Douglas, since this CCPD even started, I think, in, uh, I realize things change and times change and everything like that. Uh, I kind of like Skip's idea to, that we continue on the uh, um, extended warranties but make them closer than 100,000 miles. You know, they break that down because, I mean, when you, when you have these cars sitting out there idling, and you know they can't turn the engine off and have the lights on or we're going to be out there with AAA giving you a new battery but these cars take a beating uh one of them well, we how many uh nah it's not important but you know the high speed chases that we do the things like that now the chases that we're going through the alleys it's happening all the time right what's so funny Did I, is there something on my nose or something no okay so anyway, uh, I don't know how we let that get past us. I guess, you know, when I was a councilman, we, we uh, did the extended warranty, you know, up to whatever it was. It, that wasn't even a question that we wouldn't do it. And uh, I guess I was a mayor then. So. Well, I'm surprised they're replacing them all because I was the one that pushed the creation of this thing. And one of the primary things that was being done, it was a laddering of the vehicles. You replace one third, one third, one third, so that you do not have the situation that was just brought up. If you have seven vehicles all at once and there's a major flaw that happened, uh, it might not happen. If it happens in all seven of them, you're out of luck. And that's why laddering of the purchase of the vehicles has been in place, I thought, since 2004, I think when I brought this on, 2004, and I'm just, I'm very curious why it changed. Mm. Uh, well, that's something for a council to look into and get with Johnny and, and find out. I like Leslie's idea of taking on Chrysler, too. Mr. Mayor, I'd like Might to well call take for the on vote. Everybody. Thank you. If I may, real quick, also, uh, as far as the warranties, um, typically anything that's unused on the warranties is prorated, and we do get a refund on unused portions of the warranties oh. at, at mm. trade in. Sounds good to me. Who, where's that money go? It goes back into uh, the sale right? of equipment line that they give you a, when you buy the vehicle. It Does it get into the, the black price. hole or is it a separate line? Well, it's a separate line, but it'll be, it, you don't actually get cash for it. It would just go towards the purchase price will be reduced. Okay. All right. Good. We had a, uh, a member call for the vote. Mr. McCormick, I kind of saw you twitch. Did you want to say something or? Oh, a twitch, okay, good. All right, so we've got a, a motion. We have a second on the table for item number uh, six, which is as read, and uh, we let everybody speak. So with that said, let's take a vote. All in favor? All opposed? It passed unanimously, thank you very much. Council, uh, because we have so many citizens here tonight, I'd like to move 17 and 18 up. 
and they take